Welcome to this extra special video episode of Nine Marks Pastors Talk. Yay! Nine Marks exists to provide biblical resources to help your church grow and become more healthy. You're Mark Dever. Learn more at ninemarks.org. And you're Jonathan Lehman, the author of the new book, One Assembly. Now, we had an earlier video podcast that we released where, Jonathan, we talked about why you would write such a book. Kind of setting the stage. This podcast conversation, we just want to climb inside the book so that if you're not going to read the book, you're going to get the argument here. We'd like you to read the book, but we want to expose what the argument is here. Right. Just to summarize what we said last time, why did we say this is an important conversation? Because it goes to the heart of what a church is. and So, so basically, you're arguing that a church is one assembly. People gather together. And that multi-service or multi-site churches are really as many churches as they have congregations. That's exactly right. Le- legally speaking, yes, the, the, we all recognize it as one church. But that North Campus is a church, the South Campus is a church, the 9 a.m. service is a church, the 11 a.m. So church just is a briefly, ser- service is a church. Summarize how you came to that conclusion. Well, I mean, it was through a lot of conversations with you and other brothers, thinking through the Bible, what is a church? And then it's it was staring at all the uses of ecclesia in the Bible. So, so conversation got it going, mm-hmm. right? But then you have to turn to the Bible. What does the Bible say? And it's staring at all the uses of ecclesia. And w- one of the things I include is an appendix with, with all of those and kind of categorizing them. But then it's also thinking through theologic. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's the word. That's almost a lexical study of the word and its yeah. uses and in, in, in exegesis. Okay, theologically now, what is a church? And... Uh, thinking about why did Jesus use the term ecclesia? You know, in Matthew's gospel, it's kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. And then wow. all of a sudden, I'll build my church. And you're like, wait, what? In Matthew 16. What, what, where, where did that term come then from? Then he repeats it in Matthew 18. That's right. And then you have to look back at the Septuagint and its uses of ecclesia. And you think about how ecclesia was used in those days. And it's then you like start, the kahal, the assembly. No, that's right, in Hebrew. Uh, so then you're asking, okay, why does Jesus use that? And, and what is a church? So well, that, that, that's, that's where the conversation and, and for me began. Presumably, the, the, uh, Matthew is inspired. Jesus wasn't speaking in Greek. He was speaking in Aramaic. Aramaic. right. But for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit has Matthew write that down, and the word that's right. used is ecclesia, and that's the word that's used then by Luke and by Paul. And that word was an already existing word. They mm-hmm. didn't make it up. Mm-hmm. So before there are Christian churches, there are non-Christian churches. Mm-hmm. And what are these non-Christian churches? What is this ecclesia being used for in the Greek language? Well, if you're looking at classical Greek, you can see it all the way back into the 4th and 5th century. I mean, open up your Greek copy of, of Aristotle if you have that. And what is it? It's it's the demos, the people. I didn't bring mine, Alberto. Do you have? Okay. <laughs> the demos, the people, right? That's the Greek word for people, demos, gather together, assemble to become an, an ecclesia. And then when those people, the, that demos... So like where they would vote. Right. Make exactly. a decision as a city. Exactly. Then when they disassembled, they were no longer the ecclesia. They were just the demos. So this is the word that Paul well, that's uses... That's classical Greek. Yeah. This is the word Paul uses in Acts in Ephesus when there's the riot happening uh-huh. because the silversmiths are getting thrown out of work because exactly their idols right. aren't selling. That's right. So they have an ecclesia in the amphitheater. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Okay, that's classical Greek. And when you look at the Old Testament and you look at Koine Greek and as it's used there in the Septuagint. You, you mean the New Testament? No, in the no. Old Testament. Okay. The Greek version of the Old Testament. Oh, yep. Uh, <clears throat> it's also seemingly uniformly used only with regard to gatherings of people. Mm. Right, so they gather at the base of Mount Sinai, and they they gather uh, in Jerusalem and so forth. So it's it's I'm not aware of an instance of it being used in the Old Testament and the mm. Greek Old Testament, in which it's it's just kind of a metaphorical idea. Right, right. It's it's actually people assembled. So then Jesus shows up and he uses that t- same term, ecclesia. Why? Well, interestingly, even if you go back to the prophet Joel, he uses that term and he talks about the assembly coming. So Jesus is saying, my new assembly is here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to build my assembly again. And when you're using assembly there in that singular sense, and it seems to be a universal reference, right. that's a kind of proleptic use. That's a use of it envisioning that final, literal, that's right, that's right. physical assembly uh-huh. uh, around the throne of God, the last day of, of all of his people. Well, in some sense, it's, it's heavenly and it's 
eschatological. Yeah. It's heavenly in the sense, think of uh, Hebrews 13, where it says, you've come to the new city. Yeah. You've come to the new church, the church. Yeah. And it's, it's, we're gathered in heaven now in some sense. Seated with him in the heavenly places. That's right. Raised up with him and seated at them. Yeah. But then, yeah, if ultimately the, the word ecclesia is an appropriate word because it's it's a final assembly that we're all anticipating. And we anticipate that now in local outposts, in local embassies of that heavenly and final assembly. So I hear what you're doing right now is summarizing your argument in the book, which yeah. I appreciate. Is that yourself also your autobiography and your journey of how you came to this conclusion? I'm not sure how you help me help me help me yeah. ask that so, a different so way. So right now I could tell you what I think nine marks of a healthy church are. Right. And I could expound them and defend them biblically, give you illustrations of them. And I could answer a different question. How did I come up with these nine marks? Mm -hmm. How in my own history did I stumble upon these when there are many other things I could have talked about? Uh, how did that happen? What what was my autobiography of of question and exp, exp, exposing myself to the answers and concluding certain sure. things. So were there any of these arguments that came first for you that began setting the dominoes falling uh, and perhaps somebody, some viewer might decide that might be a particularly helpful place for them to start looking into this? Well, certainly, and this may not be what you're looking for, but in my own life, the experience of being a member of Capitol Hill Baptist and then at Clifton Baptist while I was in seminary, mm -hmm. and then again, Capitol Hill Baptist, and the inescapable necessity of gathering with the same group of people, even when it got to be a thousand of them. And I certainly didn't know them all by name, by any stretch of the map. Maybe I knew 200, 300 by name. How crucial that was to my discipleship and the fact that here we are all together. And I know my 50 and you know that you're 50 and they know and the kind of this spider web of connectivity that is the assembly and how crucial that was to the life and dis discipline and growth of, of the church certainly gave me a set of intuitions that thought, okay, th there's something here. And I, I just can't even fathom not gathering with another assembly and yet calling all us one church. Mm -hmm. So there was that life experience. Uh, but it was, it was finally, again, as I said before, conversations and biblical study that sort of affirmed biblically what my experience had taught me. I, I, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. And I do think I've often seen in people their experience of church is going to teach them things that they might not get just abstractly by reading something. Well, it makes something more believable. Yeah. Right? Well, And, and if, I've, if I've been living, let's say I've been living in a multi-site or multi-service all my life, mm -hmm. and let's say I've, I've done well as a Christian. Yeah. You know, I've grown mature. Yeah. I think you'll initially encounter this argument like, really? Hey, it's been fine. What, what we've done has been fine for me. Mm -hmm. Uh Seems like you're making too big a deal of no. this, and I, I understand that. Yeah, I think you know you can read about love, and then you can experience love. Yeah, there you go. And I certainly don't. I'm not saying you can only experience love in a single service church. I think you know brothers and sisters in multi site, multi service churches can certainly experience love. I'm just using this as an analogy. Uh, I think when we when we read, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We can read that as somebody who doesn't love the Lord, and we can still have an understanding of what it means. That's accurate if if partial and shallow. But then when we're converted and we actually begin to love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we then have an understanding of it, a, a sort of 3D depth to it. And what I hear in your argument that you're making in this book is that part of the proof of the truth of this is in the experience of it. It's, it's the proof's in the pudding. It's when you begin to experience the kind of claims on your discipleship, on uh, your claims to holiness and love in the way you're relating to others yeah. in a particular unified assembly that meets together, that gathers literally every week. Well, let, 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 let me put it this way, and this kind of came back to our last conversation, but I remember one time I was sitting at lunch with a guy who from a, a, a prominent multi-site church, and um, he was like, but, but Jonathan, we we know they, they, they couldn't all gather together in one place. And I, I showed him from... And he's talking about the church in Jerusalem. Yeah. And I showed him, uh, and you know, they called the full number of disciples together. That happens in three times in the early chapters of Acts. They called the full number of disciples together. And he said, well, we know they couldn't have all met together. And I looked at him, and then I read the text again. 
And then he kind of laughed. Okay, fine. They all got together. What was going on there? Well, he had a set of intuitions based mm-hmm. on his experience mm-hmm. that it's just, and he had this kind of argument he had grabbed onto. He'd heard from some professor somewhere, mm-hmm. picked up in a book. It just, he couldn't even begin to really have the conversation with me because his experience and the little bit of teaching he'd received was otherwise. And there's a sense in which Mark in writing this book, I almost feel like in some ways I felt discouraged from the get go. I'm like, this is just spitting into the wind. Yeah, I think I've had to prod you on this book far more than any other book you've done. That's probably true. Yeah. Because in some ways, I feel like this is just people aren't going to accept it until they've been inside of it. One one tip for you, if you're planning to actually look at the book or read the book, is in a lot of books, you can skip the introduction and just read the chapters. You really need to read the introduction of this book. It really is. Jonathan has important. like 20 or 30 pages of pretty <laughs> substantial yeah. kind of preparing the ground for the construction project. So... Uh, that's where you talk about the difference between multi-service and multi-site. That's right. How it's the same, how it's different. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about how these structures and conversations about them are actually moral conversations. Do you want to just explain what you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, ba- ba- basically, where we locate authority is is a moral matter. So if if only the say pastors have authority, well, that's that's going to affect the nature of our discipleship. If some body outside of the church, the presbytery, the bishop, has authority, again, that's going to impact the moral shape of the church. If 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 the priest or if the bishop has authority and I don't, well, that what does that do? That relieves me of certain responsibilities. Mm-hmm. It pushes the responsibilities into his hands. I, I do I'm or not, don't have to think through some things. And that's right. I'm not obligated to do something. I can sit back. No. So church government, which seems like an arcane topic to some, is actually a moral conversation, mm-hmm. an ethical conversation. Who is responsible for what? Yeah. So these polity shifts, changes, authority changes, actually reshape the church morally. Yeah. You, you say at the end of your introduction, if we're going to know what to do when the building is so full, the usher can't find people's seats. We need a different set of intuitions, intuitions that are more like Christ and the apostles. I hope that even if you aren't finally persuaded by my exegesis, you'll enjoy meditating on the Bible and the church. Amen. Wow. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I that so. was a kind and, uh, and accurate thing because I think, you know, having read this in various forms more than once, I think even if you're not finally persuaded, you may profit from uh, many of the thoughts in here. And many of the things it helps you to freshly rethink. Now, Mark, in some ways, you're the one who, as you said, you goaded me to this. You've had that basic conviction, which in many ways I think has started this conversation for many of us, that an ecclesia means an assembly. Yeah. How did you arrive at that fundamental conviction, and why have you continued to push it for so long? Yeah. Against stuff you read in yeah. seminary, against your professors, against some of your close friends. Well, yeah, you talk about intuitions a good bit in your book. And I think I'm a little bit of a funny figure, because although it looks like I was born in 1960, I've hung around a lot in 1540, uh-huh. in 1620. Uh, that's where, uh, in, in 1870, that's where a lot of my uh, conversation has been had and probably thoughts have been shaped. So I have spent in reading probably more time with dead people than currently on earth people. And you have been convinced that an ecclesia means an ecclesia. None of the people that I hang out with back there thought anything else. So this is the the opinion that I think you're representing in this book is what all of at least Protestant Christianity has understood about the local church. We can have other arguments about a national church and things like that, but about the local, about a particular congregation. So, um, you know, when when a church in 1720 in Northampton gets too big, they don't start a second service. Right. They take 200 members who live south of the street, they build a new meeting house, and now you've got two churches. That's the way, if you look around every city in America, you'll find multiple Baptist churches. Well, any of them that are started before 1950, that, that's what happened. They were just growing out of another one. And there would be a mission over on this avenue or this street, and so they would start this church. And then the, their members who lived there would peaceably divide and head over there. Well, it was it was that fundamental conviction that made me yeah look more carefully than I ever had before at the uses of ecclesia throughout yeah. the Bible. And what struck me is how much assumption work was going on. So one, one of the 
most premier sources I've been told these days for understanding uses of it is Roger Gehring's House, Church, and Mission. And what struck me is I kind of went city by city through the New Testament Uh is all the assuming he does. So let's just listen to a few bullet points here. He says, therefore, we can assume a plurality of house churches for Philippi. It can be assumed there existed more than one in Thessalonica. If our conclusions are correct, then in Corinth there existed a plurality of house churches. The text does not explicitly mention a house in Sennacherib, but verse 2 implies one. Is this in your chapter 2? Yeah, this is page 76. In some way... That's the most important page, because yeah. it's like they have they have assumption plus assumption plus assumption equals somehow certainty, and that that's what that's what he goes on to say. He says a plurality of house churches was demonstrated with certainty for Rome, probably for Thessalonica, possibly. Well, it's, it's right around like, there on pages eighty, eighty one, eighty two. You have that very helpful visual. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I, I I look at how the the Greek word is used yeah. and what what multi site says is that a group of Christians gathered together becomes a service, a site. Yeah. And what a church actually is, is an administrative mechanism gathering these different services sites together. Whereas in the New Testament, what you see is that a group of Christians gathered together become an ecclesia, whether that ecclesia is gathered or scattered. Yeah. Right. So what does it take to be a team? Well, you have to gather together, play football or basketball to be a team. Now, we can still refer to the team even as they're scattered throughout the week. Yeah. You know, the, t- the team is spending the night in the hotel. They're in different rooms. They're not together. But to be a team, you have to get together to play whatever the sport is. Yeah. And the word ecclesia is used in that same way, I argue, and I, I hope demonstrate uh, in the New Testament. You just don't have churches that don't gather. Yeah. In in your book, you certainly spend a lot of time in Acts and the Epistles. Yeah. You do spend a good bit of time in Matthew's Gospel. Yeah, certainly in chapter one, that's right. Yeah. And in establishing uh, what e- a church is. Yeah. And even the Great Commission comes in to have a role to play, which might surprise people. Uh-huh. You want to explain that for a minute? Well, you people tend to, uh, Christians tend to read Matthew 28 in isolation as if it's being given to individuals. But when you start looking more carefully at the text, it, I think it becomes clear you can only read Matthew 28 in the context of Matthew 16 and 18. So right. just, just look at the language. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Well, where do we hear about heaven and earth? Well, the ones who'd receive keys of the kingdom for binding and loosing on heaven, what's loosed on earth, right? Uh, then, then Jesus says, baptize them into my name. Well, who has the authority to baptize them into his name? Well, presumably it's the one, Matthew 18, verse 20, who gather in his name. And what does he say to those who, in Matthew 18, he, gather in his name? He says, I will be with you. Or, when two or three gather in my name, there I am among them. Mm-hmm. And then what does he say in Matthew 28, verse 20? I will be with you always. Well, with whom is he going to be always? Well, presumably with the ones with whom he is now. So you have at least three clear, pretty clear textual links Uh between Matthew 16, 18, and 28, which tells me Matthew 28 is given to Hmm. churches. Churches are called to fulfill the Great Commission. And again, as you've put it, Mark, that's not a new Protestant idea. Right. Lick Duncan talks about that all the time, for instance, and many others. Um, Lick Duncan's a Protestant, last I checked. No, that's right. Yep. Uh, the uh, the fact that all the people who heard Jesus say that uh-huh. went and gave their lives starting churches, right? I think also helps us to understand how those first hearers of the Great Commission understood it. Well, so that's precisely what we then see play out in the book of Acts. Yeah, and in the letters. What must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized. And 3,000 were baptized that day and added to their number. What number? The church in Jerusalem. Any passage of Scripture uh, now uh, that's surprisingly central to or significant in your understanding of this discussion that was kind of absent in your thinking 10 years ago? Well, we just mentioned the connections between Matthew 16, 18, 28. I think those are crucial, and that's why an almost entire chapter centers around them. In chapter one. Well, what's interesting then is how that same language shows up, for instance, in Corinth. I think Corinth is a great test study, uh, test case for this whole thing, because mm. Corinth is actually one of the first churches that multi-siders point to and say, oh, that must have been a multi-site church. They couldn't have all met together. What's interesting is you get like five, no, eight times uh, examples of the church in Corinth meeting all together. And one of those times even sounds like Matthew 18, 20. Think about 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4. Paul says, when you are 
assembled in the name of the Lord. What does that yeah. remind you of? Where two or three are gathered in my name. Mm-hmm. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord, my spirit is present in the power of the Lord. So Jesus. you didn't just happen to see each other at the market square. No, that's right. Yeah. Or behind closed doors of the elders meeting on a Thursday night. Yeah. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord. So you being the congregation. The congregation at yeah. Corinth. The power of the Lord. His power somehow is there. And we were assembly. having a good prayer meeting. Hand this man over to Satan, right? Mm. And then you get in chapter 11, wait for one another, he says. Mm-hmm. Right? You come together think you're taking the Lord's Supper. You're not, because you're, you're not all together. Wait for one another, he says. Uh, even in the book of Romans, where he's, he's, he's writing the Corinthians, uh, he, or I'm sorry, he's writing from Corinth to Rome, at the end of Rome, he talks about, um, uh, who, who is it? So, so-and-so and the whole church which meets at their house greets you. Yeah. Who? I can't think of it. Yeah. Anyway, so we even get it. The church in Corinth meets in this guy's house. Yeah. There's, a, there's eight different instances where we see the yeah, church of Corinth me. all meeting together. And uh, it and uh, I, I just, it, 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 it boggles my mind that that's an example of multiple churches when the text clearly says to the contrary. So yeah, things Gaius, like that. Gaius, who's host to me and to the whole church, greet you. Yep, Gaius. Yep. They meet in Gaius's house. Yeah. Well, another argument right there is the whole church. They say, well, the whole church is the whole church. Then clearly there's sub uh, sub churches, which is just a weird argument to me. Yeah. You know, Mark talks about the whole church went out, or the whole city went out to see Jesus. Yeah. That doesn't mean an aggregation of sub cities. Yeah. yeah. Just the whole city went out. Yeah. John, there's much else we could talk about. Thank you for producing such a thick book. Uh, in such a thin physical space. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I would, particularly if you're a pastor and you are spending your life shepherding the flock of God, uh, I would encourage you to hang out with people before you who for centuries have understood the Bible to teach that a church is a congregation. Uh, maybe they were all wrong and if you think differently, you're right, but it could be you've not thought about it correctly, and I don't know of another modern guide than this one that Jonathan has produced that will bring you some of the understanding of Scripture that they had, that it, it's at least worth you uh, toughing it through uh, 150 pages to try to think and see what you think about what God has revealed about the nature of his church, and is it in fact a local church, one congregation? Jonathan, thank you for all your work on this, brother. Thanks, brother. Thanks for pushing me onward and helping along the way. Amen. Let's pray there's good fruit from it. Amen. 